Thank you. Thanks very much. Good afternoon. And thank you for inviting me to speak here today. Because I use a computer, I feel as though I know all of you. <laughs> and I'd like to begin by thanking each and every one of you for looking up all that stuff for me 24-7. <laughs> there was not so long ago uh, an astronomer who was giving a lecture to a very full audience. And he said that the, Earth was gonna, the sun was going to burn out in 5 billion years at which point an agitated member of the audience leapt up and said, what? What did you say? And he said, I said the sun was going to burn out in five billion years. And the guy says, Phew, I thought you said five million years. <laughs> I begin with this story, A, because I find it funny, and B, because it touches on our peculiar relation to science in this country, and more particularly, on our disinclination to learn or understand what science tells us is happening, has happened, or will soon happen. Our ignorance in this department seems only equal to Americans' congenital reluctance to master any foreign language. <laughs> it is scarcely a secret that we live in a terrifying world, a world in which the viability of planet Earth itself hangs in the balance. In these unprecedented circumstances, it is hardly surprising that some people are inclined to shoot the messenger rather than confront the message. The irony is that most Americans while content to profit by and from amazing scientific achievements, falling in love with the latest must-have gadgetry, display very little interest in how such miracles work. What science causes airplanes to fly or cancers to go into remission? As long as the air-conditioned car goes, who cares what's under the hood? More than that, there are certain segments of the population who actively make war on science, rejecting information that frightens them. They cherry-pick the science they find acceptable or useful or seek out reassuring alternative facts to suit their emotional requirements when objective data upsets them. I must state at the outset that I'm about as far from a scientist as you can get. I am still puzzled by gravity. I must add that I typically read very little science fiction, though I adore Jules Verne and his scientific, or I should say unscientific, but presciently entertaining rival, H.G. Wells. Their differences are worth noting. When Verne shot his rocket to the moon, he did the math and figured out the rocket would have to leave from Cape Canaveral, that the capsule, when it returned, would have to be recovered at sea, etc. By contrast, Wells simply dreamed up an anti-gravity metal called Cavorite and floated his travelers upward to the lunar surface. Science fantasy versus science fiction. No, I am not a scientist, just an artist. As Joseph Conrad wrote, my aim above all is to make you see. I tell stories, the purpose of which is to make people laugh or cry in a word to make you feel. And if at the end of what is meant to be an emotional journey, you wind up thinking about what you have felt, so much the better. But before we go any further, two caveats. First, I'd like to observe that artists lose all proprietary authority over their creations once they're finished. Artists put messages in bottles and then toss them into life's ocean, 
hoping that someone will find and decode what's inside them. But we won't be around in every instance of discovery to say, you're right, you're wrong. That's not gum, that's gun, <laughs> etc. When and if they do. The artist's opinion by that point is just another opinion. People will make of works of art what they will. They always have. In short, I am not the answer to a series of equations at the end of a math book. I can say what I intended or attempted to accomplish, in a word, what I thought I was doing, but not what any of it means to each of you, much less whether I've succeeded in my intention. My second caveat is this. Like magic tricks, when once explained, an artist's answers tend to disappoint. Art, and science too, for all I know, is much more interesting posing questions than answering them. As you may gather, this is going to be a talk about ideas. There's no visual aids. Answers may be few. But perhaps some of the questions will hold your attention. So here goes. Unlike Oscar Wilde, who maintained that all art is useless, Leo Tolstoy, the author of my favorite novel, War and Peace, once stated that the purpose of art is to teach us to love life. No matter how beautiful, terrible, what we depict, I think Tolstoy is right. The bottom line function of art is to infatuate us with life. The purpose of art, and if the purpose of art is to teach us to love life, Star Trek, it seems to me, totally fills this bill. Granted, it is more fiction than science. But I think many of you, whom I infer to be devotees, first became interested in the universe by responding to Star Trek's message about life, its variety, its value, and as Spock would say, its possibilities. Tolstoy also quibbled with Shakespeare. He said, to be or not to be is not the question. We're here. The question is, now what? Isn't that also a Star Trek question? I happen to be a slow reader, a slow thinker, and a slow understander. It may come as a surprise, but when Star Trek was first telecast, Shortly after the Civil War, <laughs> I was not among its adherents. What I saw was a lot of folks running around cheesy sets wearing what looked like Dr. Denton's and a man with pointy ears. I never stuck around. Later, as an undergraduate at the University of Iowa, uh, a friend also from New York but getting his PhD was hooked on the show. He watched it daily after he dropped acid. As I recollect, he did this for about 54 straight J's, at the end of which time his wife left him. <laughs> there was nothing in this ritual that encouraged me to watch the show. <laughs> it was many years later, while working in Hollywood, that another friend, an executive at Paramount Pictures, encouraged me to overcome my snobbery and meet Harve Bennett, who'd been assigned to produce the second Star Trek feature film. Bennett had produced a great deal of television, including The Mod Squad, Six Million Dollar Man, and the first big-time miniseries, Rich Man, Poor Man. He had never made a feature film, but we got along famously. He showed me Star Trek The Motion Picture. Many people are pleased to knock this film, but I am not among them. Director Robert Wise went boldly where no film had gone before. If he had made mistakes or misjudgments along the way, I would learn from them. But at the time, Star Trek depicted a world I didn't understand and a philosophy to which I was unable to subscribe. Other than technology, I see scant evidence of hum the human condition has changed. We've added buttons. We still cannot seem to get past using our fists 
when we find no other solution to our disagreements. It would take me years and my own involvement with Star Trek to change my views about the series and to understand or start to understand what it was trying to accomplish. I did not find the original film, as I said, especially engaging, but Harv persisted and made me watch several of the original television episodes, which proved more absorbing than I had anticipated. I began to perceive striking innovations in the show, things I'd originally failed to notice while channel surfing, the unprecedented melting pot, multinational, multicultural cast, the shocking first televised interracial kiss, the show's willingness to confront and grapple with social issues that by setting them in a sci-fi context allowed viewers to contemplate subject matter that if set on Earth might push so many bias buttons that shackled by our prejudices, we might never consider such topics objectively. The best science fiction, it seems to me, whether set in the past, the future, or outer space, seems always to reflect the human condition of the time in which it was created. Watching these episodes also put me pleasantly in mind of something I liked, but it took me a while, it always takes me a while, um, to tease out what it was, a series of novels by C.S. Forrester, who also wrote The African Queen, um, about an officer in the Royal Navy during the Napoleonic Wars, one Captain Horatio Hornblower. Hornblower's adventures and exploits, which always included a girl in every port, had fed my pre-adolescent fantasy life, and I now recognized with an agreeable shock that Captain Kirk was Hornblower in outer space. Later, when I discussed this with Bill Shatner, he became excited and said, that's exactly what Roddenberry said. <laughs> Now I was starting to become stoked about the idea of directing a hornblower movie with spaceships. But even after all this time, an involvement with three feature films, that would be two, four, and six for those of you who keep score, I still hadn't gleaned all that Star Trek had to teach me. It may seem strange how long it took me to understand that while hornblower might be a way into Star Trek, it wasn't all there was. Adding submarines or battleships might have enabled me to create Star Trek movies, but it was only after the fact that I finally began to grasp how essential the idea of the show was and what made it precious to so many people. And in Star Trek VI, Spock says that logic is the beginning of wisdom, but not the end. Hornblower might be the beginning of a way to think about Star Trek, but it certainly was not the end. Predicting the future, whether in real life or what we term science fiction, is a tricky business, and most prognosticators, professional and amateur, get the future wrong. True, Star Trek got cell phones right, <laughs> but who could have foreseen Donald Trump? <laughs> science fiction always winds up depicting the time in which it was made rather than the time in which it is supposedly set. But one thing Star Trek does that finally resonated with me was its optimism, its implicit thesis that problems were capable of solutions. They may not always be the simplest or most gratifying solutions, but again, quoting Spock, there are always possibilities. Mankind has frequently been confronted by seeping, seemingly insoluble problems that were then somehow solved. You people must know all about solving problems. To take a random instance, by the turn of the 20th century, New York City, clogged with horse-drawn vehicles, was literally drowning in shit. The population, the pollution, excuse me, threatened the safety and health 
of the great metropolis. And then, mirabile dictu, along came the automobile. And in short order, the horse manure problem went away, granted, to be replaced by car exhaust and engine noise. But with recent advances in electric cars, some of which I've lately sampled in the neighborhood, maybe the exhaust problem and even the drunk driver problem will go away. Similarly, bubonic plague periodically decimated huge swaths of humanity. And then came the miracle of vaccination. And diseases, including smallpox, tuberculosis, and polio, were for all intents and purposes eradicated. People who were so frightened by the prospect of climate change that they cannot concede its reality would do well to immerse themselves in Star Trek, which can, like Tolstoy, teach us to love life, believing that just as science shows us difficulties, science coupled with men and women of goodwill can uncover solutions. So too, Star Trek's science of optimism can fill us with plausible hope that human beings working together can surmount seemingly intractable difficulties. As I began by observing, we live in a terrifying world. I confess, a world whose very survival seems to be hanging by a fraying thread. No wonder we spend so much time amusing ourselves to death in trivial pursuits or insubstantial escapism, video games, or movies featuring men in spandex, so-called superheroes, saints for a secular society where Mickey Mouse and Superman head the pantheon of gods. Because mere heroes are no longer sufficient. What I have more recently come to understand is that Star Trek, on a more sophisticated level than Batman, for example, provides what is perhaps a more plausible optimism than Superman. It attempts to show a world not where supermen can rescue us, but where humankind can improve, where the definition of progress isn't that just because we can do something, it doesn't follow that we must do it. Technology must not become the tail wagging the dog. It does not follow that because we can blow ourselves to smithereens, we must blow ourselves to smithereens. That men and women are capable of learning from past mistakes. In a word, capable of evolving. Dangerous word with connotations to another word, evolution. But there we've swallowed it. Star Trek arguably doesn't promise superpowers. But it does hold out the possibility of evolved change, a belief that human beings may never be perfect, but that striving for perfection, trying in the spirit of intelligent and humane inquiry, is a legitimate and desirable goal. In addition to Tolstoy's dictum that the purpose of art is to teach us to love life, Star Trek has taught me something else that art has the power to change how we see and experience the world. It is no accident that most original members of NASA and JPL got their start and inspiration watching that crude television series. The sun, remember, will extinguish itself in five billion, not five million years. Star Trek urges care in carefully carving out our human destinies, we could do worse than to consult the science of optimism. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. If there are no more questions. 
Hi, I'm Pierre. Uh, thanks for being here today. Um, there's a... Um, no charge. <laughs> kind of um, uh, non-written uh, rule among uh, Star Trek fans than um, even-numbered uh, movies uh, in the franchise, the original one, six oh, films, are the best ones. Uh, how do you react to that and how do you see the, the odd-numbered movies in the series? <laughs> Well, first of all, it's, you're obviously very discerning and, and, and com completely right. I don't know what it is about those even-numbered Star Treks that is worth our attention or devotion or adoration. I'm just picking random words. Um, I'm not about to pick apart anybody else's movies. Uh, I feel that I was very lucky. Movies are like souffles, you know, they, they either rise or they don't. Uh, and uh, the fact that mine rose is like, a, my, my mother is very happy, what can I tell you? Um, I don't know what else to, to I, think it, I think it's good that people like the even number ones. I, remember I said artists aren't the best judges of their own work, so it's just like, Whatever I say is just another opinion. Mr. Meyer, thank you so much for being here. Um, I have a question about the movie The Day After. Um, for those who don't know what it is, it's a TV movie that was um, scared the bejesus out of most of North America. It was all about nuclear annihilation during the Cold War. So I'm just curious um, if you can tell us how that project came about and um, maybe your reaction to the country's reaction to that movie. And This is a, an enormous topic. For those of you who do not know, the Day After is the most watched movie ever made for television. I didn't write it. I directed it. It came out in 1983. It was watched by 100 million people in one night. The New York Post called me a traitor on its editorial page. <laughs> uh, there are lots of stories about The Day After. My, and I can tell you, you know, a little bit about how I became involved. And then I'll tell you my favorite story, which is not so much about me. Um, I was the fourth director that ABC uh, television offered to do this movie. The thing about nuclear war is that the nuclear dilemma, the ability of the human race to extinguish itself, is a relatively recent development, 1945. At the same time, there is something so terrifying that most of us prepare not to, we don't think about it. We've learned to kind of dial it out. And we go about our business with this Damoclean nuclear sword hanging over our necks, and we sort of pretend it, it isn't there. And we, we may tell ourselves the world is, you know, that we're doing OK. But you've no idea how many close calls or how many bombs have been dropped that, by the way, didn't go off, including two once on North Carolina. Um, so we're hanging by a thread here. I didn't want to have anything to do with this either. I was having a good time. I was making Star Trek movies and meeting girls. It was all fine. Uh, but I was also being psychoanalyzed at the time. And my shrink never spoke. You have to understand how psychoanalysis works, is that you're doing the heavy lifting. You go in there, and you say whatever comes into your head. And at the end of it, he plays it back for you, but slightly rearranged. But he's not volunteering. He's not a guru. But in this case, he opened his mouth. So I'm lying there on the couch trying to figure a way not to do this. And he said, well, I guess this is where we find out who you really are. <laughs> and I, I realized at that point that I had no choice, because I have to shave in the morning. And that's tricky if you don't look at yourself. And I actually corralled a lot of people into the movie with that damn line. Uh, I told my cinematographer from Star Trek II, we're going to do this nuclear thing. He goes, no, 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 don't ask. Come on. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. 
the one time this town is going to allow you to put your work in the service of your beliefs, you're going to pass and bitch at dinner parties? I think this is where we find out who you really are. <laughs> so that's how, the, that's how I got into making the movie. And there's a million details. There are books about this movie. Uh, there are PhD theses, and there are crazy stories. There was a general on Castro's staff who later said that the Cuban Missile Crisis had not been real to him until he had seen the movie. Can you imagine? And the morning after the movie was on TV, and I sat and watched it, and I thought, who in their right mind would sit through this. It's available on Blu-ray, by the way, if you want to. <laughs> uh, I don't think I'm selling it very well. I, I, uh, anyway, I was mildly astounded, to put it mildly, that 100 million people had watched it and the phones were ringing off the hook the next morning. Um, I guess all that publicity from people running up and down protesting the movie you know, but it had scared up a lot of, you know, nothing like being banned in Boston to sell books. Uh, at which point, the uh, new, the media, as we call them, ever helpful, ran around with their microphones saying, did this movie change your mind about nuclear war, yay or nay? And then came rather gleefully, I thought, running back to me and saying, according to our morning after survey, your movie didn't change anybody's minds about nuclear war one way or the other. What do you have to say? And I said, well, number one, I don't think people change their minds overnight. Number two, I don't think they'd tell you if their minds were changed by a TV movie. <laughs> number three. I'm not sure people know what they really think anyway. You know, if you say, do you believe in God or you ask questions, people tell you, give you an answer. But maybe until there's a gun put to their head, you don't really know what they really think. But there was one person whose mind was changed by the movie very fast. And he happened to be the president of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Um, there's a lot of evidence, including Reagan's own memoir, for the effect that the movie had. But the end result was that he flew to Reykjavik, met with Gorbachev, whom he had previously called the architect of the evil empire or something, and they signed the Intermediate Range Nuclear Weapons uh, Treaty, the Missile Treaty. And uh, he had come to power believing in a winnable nuclear war. Uh, and he changed his mind. And not only does his own memoir say this, but I became friends with uh, his in-house biographer, a rather interesting man named Edmund Morris, who won the Pulitzer Prize for his book, The Rise of Theodore Roosevelt. And I got to know Morris. And, and uh, Morris said he would lived in the White House for three years while he was writing this book. He said the only time he saw Ronald Reagan freak out was after the movie. There's lots more stories about it, but it's probably to date, until I got to speak to you guys, the most worthwhile thing I ever got to do with my life. Mr. Meyer, thanks for joining us. I want to um, ask you about the, um, the theme that you were speaking about in terms of optimism, regarding optimism in science fiction. Um, I'm curious, uh, more specifically, like what are the like you you um, you mentioned a couple of times about uh, science fiction as reflecting the state of society and mm -hmm. the, kind of the concerns, the preoccupations of uh, contemporary uh, uh, folks. Um, so I'm curious, like what what do you see as um, kind of circumstances that will give rise to kind of different uh, um, forms of science fiction? And I guess the what. Um, what uh, what I'm what I'm referring to in particular is like often we see, and this is something that um, other folks like film critics, uh, um, cultural critics have seen, is that uh, science fiction, especially um, over the past couple of decades, it's very much been in the sort of cyberpunk uh, mode. It's uh, like this really kind of dystopian depictions of um, of capitalism, uh, maybe going back to Blade Runner, maybe going back beyond, and how that's a kind of for some people that's a kind of or 
the origins of that is a kind of a, a critique of uh, ne neoliberal uh, capitalism. I'm curious if you kind of share that, and then what what do you think like might give rise to um, sort of new inspirations for science fiction uh, into the future? Um, you know, or what might kind of do you have thoughts about like what might sort of result in a more sort of optimistic or the return of a more optimistic vision, like what you were referring to in Star Trek? Well, again, this is just one person's extremely uninformed opinion. But I look at the world and, at the moment, and I see what I consider to be some very ominous trends. Um, I see a very divisive and destructive leader in this country. I see the sort of disappointment and failure of democracies around the world, whether we're talking about India under Modi um, or um, you know, various uh, European uh, countries that are all drifting right. And I find it very chilling and very frightening. But I think that speaking for myself and my own creative ideas, um, I would take a, whatever science fiction I'm working on and try Again, I use the word plausibly, plausibly, to uh, construct scenarios that are believably optimistic out of, you know, take the horse shit, you know, image that, that it, it looks really bad. And things have looked really bad before. They've looked bad politically. They've looked bad in the midst of the bubonic plague. They have looked bad before. And you, when you read certain histories of certain times, if you read about Andrew Johnson, who was, you know, will give the, the incumbent, you know, a run for his money as the worst president, when you look at some terrible political campaigns that have been run in times before this, and Thomas Jefferson was one of the worst offenders when he ran against John Adams, and he hired people to write the most awful awful things, untrue. And Adams was the first president, not the only president, not to attend the inauguration of his successor, even though he later patched up everything with Thomas Jefferson. I don't know if you know this story, but they never saw each other again. They had collaborated on the Declaration of Independence. And Adams went up to Braintree, Massachusetts after his presidency. Jefferson retreated to Monticello. They never saw each other again. But they had a mutual friend, Dr. Benjamin Rush, who said to John Adams, this is a shame. You guys like started a country. <laughs> you really not going to ever say anything to him? You know, he's got a birthday coming up. Why don't you send him a card? And Adam said, well, supposing he doesn't answer. And Rush said, John, send him a card. So he sends him a letter, you know, happy birthday. And he was absolutely delighted, stunned. After all this acrimony and time and distance, he got an instant reply. And thus begins the most famous correspondence in American letters, that for the last 10, 12 years of their lives, these guys write about everything. They write about the weather. They write about their children. They write about their farms. They write about, but they're also writing about the country and about themselves and before the bar of history. And if that isn't overcoming something, I don't know what. But they did better yet. They died on the same day. What day would that be? You bet. July 4th, 50 years to the day after they signed the declaration, after they wrote it. And John Adams' last words were, Thomas Jefferson still lives. So things are possible. And it isn't just science fiction that reflects the time in which it was created. All art reflects the time in which it was created. Mozart doesn't just sound like Mozart. He sounds like late 18th century Middle European music. Renoir doesn't just look like Renoir, he looks like 19th century French Impressionism. 
you can identify. If I show you four movies that are set in 1776, and one was made in 1906, and one is made in 1936, and one is made in 1996, and the other one is made in 2006, you will know within five minutes, most, within five years, when those works of art were created. Either because of the way people look, the way they sound, what comes out of their mouths, how long their eyelashes are, what their hairstyle is, or what their political ideology is, is invested in the content of the film. So science fiction is not alone, you know, and it, speaking for myself, I just tell stories. And I've never cared whether it was a future story or a past story, comical, tragical, tragical, historical, doesn't matter. I just want it to be a good story. And somebody said, well, what's your definition of a good story? My definition of a good story is that after you've heard it, you understand why I wanted to tell it to you. Um, and I wanted, I wanted to teach you to love life. From the Dory here, um, from Bradley in San Francisco. He said, my project at Google is named Tricorder after the Star Trek device. What is your favorite instance of a product, technology, or fashion that you think was inspired by Star Trek? Oh, gosh. This calls for a level of expertise that I think is beyond my pay grade. Um, that f phone thing, I think, is the most remarkable instance of science fiction actually prognosticating, predicting something that was coming. You could argue that the Dick Tracy two-way wristwatch uh, was sort of in the same uh, vein. Um, but it, it, the, the cell phone seems to bear a remarkable resemblance. Of course, they don't no longer need the flip top uh, of it. But otherwise, it was pretty cool. It's a scary device. <laughs> That phone is like smarter than me, which may not be saying that much, but I may be smarter than a lot of you too. So, <laughs> so you talked a little bit about how, as an artist, you're trying to say things. So I was wondering if you could just mention a few, maybe particular things that you were trying to say, or details that you were um, that you had a hand in, or wanted to do a particular way in some of those Star Trek movies. Well, again, you're, it looks almost like you're asking for answers at the back of the book, which I'm not, you know, yeah, my intention was. Intention, yeah. Not for what you did. What I think the best villains in movies are villains that you can agree with. Um, when, you, when you talk about Khan in my movie, for example, he's got a point. <laughs> Admiral Kirk. Never bothered to check on our progress. Hmm? Um, when you look at Richard III, there are problems there. You can understand why this is an angry, bitter man. Um, and it doesn't always have to be something that's sort of self-evident in that way. I was once working on a James Bond movie. And I was told before I got on the plane to London, we have two questions. What does the villain want? And parenthetically, remember, he's already wanted the golden Fort Knox, the atom bombs, the guided missiles, control of outer space, control of the water. And number two, keep it simple. <laughs> well, it's a long plane ride. And you know, you have, I'm sure you all know, you have smart days and stupid days. <laughs> days when you come home and you go, oh, oh. And then there are days when you go, hello? This is why they pay you the big bucks. So I said, I'm meeting in a room. There was like 30 people sitting in the room. And I said, OK, it seems to me when you look at James Bond movies that they have something of the formality of an English sonnet. It's a highly structured thing or a haiku or something, you know, it, it starts with the amazing opening stunt, followed by colorful title credits, theme song, followed by James Bond goes to see M and banters with Monty Penny, uh, gets assignment from M, and then there's action sequence, action sequence, action sequence, until he meets Mr. Big, who says, no, Mr. Bond, it's not about the money, it's about, you know, fill in the blank. And so I thought, imagine all this has happened. 
and Bond is now in Mr. Big's lair. And in this version of events, Mr. Big says, you know, Mr. Bond, everything that's happened to you up till now has been a kind of test. I just wanted to see if you were the man for me. And I think you may just be. I think, when you get to know me, that you'll find out that fundamentally, I'm a people person. <laughs> There's too many of them. <laughs> even lemmings. Even lemmings, Mr. Bond. And he pushes a button, and oh, look, there I am. Um, have, I, have I been there the whole time? Yeah. The how? Yeah. Was I doing the same thing back there that I was? Okay. <laughs> then why are you looking? Anyway. Um, He says, he pushes the buttons, and all these monitors come up of overpopulation. Traffic jams in Los Angeles, starving people in Ethiopia, whatever. Even lemmings, Mr. Bond, know what to do when they grow too numerous. I am willing to bite the bullet on a question that no politician will even touch. Will you help me? 007, that's some kind of license, isn't it? How much game are you allowed to bag with that license? Will you, will you help me save planet Earth? And there's like dead silence in this room. Here's a villain. You he was absolutely right. And his idea was to start a war between India and China, the two most populous, populous nations. And the next day, I came back, and it was off the table. <laughs> Too serious. <laughs> but I had come up with, I had fulfilled the assignment. It was simple. It hadn't been done before. Uh, and you, my dictum, if you can agree with the villain, then the hero really has to be on his mettle. Bond really has to be good. And oh, I said, yeah, and Bond says, you're right. I will help you. And I said, don't worry. The smart people in the audience know he's not really going to help him. And the stupid people will be surprised when he doesn't help him, so you can't lose. <laughs> oh, did it? I didn't see it. Oh, anyway, I see little movies. You know, it's just, there's a movie called The Hummingbird Project that I saw. Did anybody see this movie? About trying to build a high-speed fiber optic network between Kansas and Wall Street to beat the amount of information by a millimeter of a second in order. That was interesting to me. I like to see movies about people trying to figure out shit. But, I, but if it gets too noisy and too loud, I kind of hunker down and find more popcorn. All right, we have another question on the Dory. This one's from Henna in San Bruno. This one says, your journey as a writer started with the 7% solution. How did you decide to write that, and what made you shift to writing screenplays? Um, OK, l l long story. And by the way, if you guys get up and leave, I can take a hint. Uh, in, the in the first place, before I, I finish this, I should say that there's I have another Sherlock Holmes book coming out in October, called The Adventure of the Peculiar Protocols, which you can pre-order, by the way, on Amazon. <laughs> um, I didn't start out wanting to be, I wanted to make movies. I fell in love with movies at a very early age, and that's what I wanted to do. So I, books was a, is a kind of an afterthought and a sideline. My father was a psychoanalyst, and I would go to school, and people say, oh, your old man's a shrink. Is he a Freudian? And I didn't know. So I said, Papa, are you a Freudian? And he said, oh, that's kind of a silly question. And I said, why? Why is it a silly question? And he said, because it's no more possible to discuss the beginnings of or the history of psychoanalysis and not start with Freud is like saying we're going to discuss the history of the discovery of America, and we're not going to talk about Columbus or the Vikings. But to suppose that nothing has happened since the Vikings is to be pretty rigid, pretty doctrinaire. When a patient comes to see me, I listen to what they say. I listen to how they say it. 
I'm especially curious as to what they do not say. I'm looking to see if they're on time, what kind of clothes they're wearing, what their body language is. I am, in short, searching for clues from them as to why they are not happy. And against this, I apply a background of some clinical experience. And I said, I'm like 13 years old or something, it sounds like detective work, what you do. And he said, it is like detective work in a way. And I suddenly realized who my father had always reminded me of, because I was reading all the Sherlock Holmes books, all the Arthur Conan Doyle books. And I thought, gosh, I wonder how much Arthur Conan Doyle knew about the writing of Sigmund Freud. And the first thing I learned is that they're both doctors. They both died in the same city within nine years of each other. Holmes is a cocaine addict. And so was, for a time, Freud. And these coincidences, and, and even more than that, because uh, Freud's first exposure to cocaine had been with a paper he wrote with two eye doctors, Kernigstein and Curler, on the uses of cocaine as an anesthetic during eye surgery. Conan Doyle had studied ophthalmology for six months in Vienna. And out of all this, over many years, because I told you I'm a very slow thinker, so I, I started this thought when, when I was 13, but the book didn't come out till I was 28. And I, no one I knew was interested in Sherlock Holmes except me. So I just waited. The Writers Guild went on strike. I was writing movies and television movies, but I wasn't allowed to. And my friend said, so now you can write that book you've always been talking about. And never, I never dreamed that it was going to become the number one best-selling novel in the United States. That, that was an, a surprise. So since I, I'm thinking we're, we're out of hands, I guess I'll let you guys go back to fixing the future. And please hurry up. Thank you. <laughs>